<laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. So uh, I wanted to talk uh, to you uh, about language contact in the borderlands of the Western regions, uh, the, the Xiyu. Um, what's what's the background um, that we're talking about? So from from most of you know that anyway, but from the second century on, uh, the communities along the, the trade routes of the ancient Silk Road in the Tarim Basin, so today's uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region of the People's Republic of China, were um, kind of proto to urban uh, centers of writing, copying, uh, translating, and transmitting texts. Okay, so we're here uh, um, in Xinjiang. One interesting kind of uh, native <laughs> or uh, regional quote uh, found in, in uh, Fasian's um, travel record is, uh, so all the kingdoms along, um, uh, all the kingdoms only had their own peculiar barbarous speech, uh, the kingdoms uh, in the Tarim Basin. The monks, however, uh, who had given up worldly life uh, and quitted their families were all students of uh, Indian books uh, and the Indian language. Um, which is which is interesting, um, and here you can see a map um, of all the languages that we have from there. Not everything is Buddhist, but there's a lot of Buddhism uh, uh, going on there. Um, uh, this is from the uh, Turfan uh, uh, um, Berlin Academy Turfan uh, Research Group, um, and you can see we have uh, in total around 25 different languages from five to six uh, different families. Uh, some of the oldest extant, uh, also Chinese uh, manuscripts actually hail, well, manuscripts meaning paper manuscripts hail from the Tarim Basin. We have a lot of languages that were not known before, like Tukharian, my kind of specialty, but also uh, Tangut um, and various other things. Uh, so the, that was a really um, uh, interesting area. And, and basically when all this stuff was discovered a little bit more than 100 years ago, um, that, that kind of changed a lot of fields and established a lot of new, of a lot of new fields, uh, as you know. Um, and, and kind of the main uh, centers, as, as you can see, were uh, down there uh, around uh, Kotan, uh, here uh, around the Turkmen area, uh, and here the um, area. Um, what's interesting is well, we, we basically have a lot of European languages there, and we also have uh, one in European language from there that was not known before, namely uh, to carry in. I think you all know the, the European languages and this kind of the, their uh, distribution uh, here, uh, but, but basically to carry in is uh, the easternmost, uh, uh, let's say, in, in, in the important historical times uh, around the first millennium, uh, it was the easternmost uh, in European uh, language um, spoken uh, in in Eurasia. Um, yes, the, the branches that are uh, of interest for us uh, are uh, in, in the Tarim Basin are Indic, uh, especially Sanskrit, but also a couple of Middle Indic uh, languages. Uh, then Tukharian uh, from around the fourth uh, century, uh, and then Saka, two um, Saka languages, so Kutani Saka and Tumshukis with the bulk like 95 or maybe even 90. 7% coming actually from, from Kotanese um, uh, Saka, uh, so an Eastern Iranian language. Um, and uh, these were kind of the major players uh, uh, around the Silk Road in the first uh, millennium uh, of our uh, era. And here, just to give you, uh, just to give you um, kind of an overview of what, what we're dealing with, most of this stuff is, uh, as you can see, um, written in uh, an Indian script, uh, a version of the Brahmi script. Uh, so this is uh, a Sanskrit document. Um, most of this stuff is exactly like this, so fragmentary. So there's no, no complete uh, uh, book, uh, no, no complete leaves. So everything is, is in quite a fragmentary uh, uh, state. And Sanskrit and Tocharian and also Kotanese that we'll see in a minute uh, use basically the same script. So I have right now a, a bigger um, uh, project where we basically try to, to do paleo paleographic analysis, mainly uh, not, not la pula, uh, but mainly to uh, basically figure out uh, um, kind of a relative chronology of, of the production of these um, fragments. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as I said, three European languages, Sanskrit, Tukar, and Saka, written in an Indic script, uh, Brahmi script, and on Chinese paper. But this was Chinese 
the local Chinese paper production. Uh, we know now um, uh, via another big project in, in Paris by Professor Georges Champinot that uh, uh, they did not buy uh, the paper uh, from, from Chinese sources but they acquired the knowledge of producing this uh, paper uh, and, and produced it locally. Yeah, here, this is Cotonese. And they're all really good. So for our philology, these, these pages that I showed you are great uh, because most of the things that we have are actually much smaller uh, uh, than, than these ones that I showed you. Uh, here, just a little overview uh, to... Oh, yeah, I forgot to delete this, sorry. Uh, doesn't, doesn't really matter, that's the problem in regime reconstruction. We don't have to dwell on that anyway. Um, but uh, basically just uh, that you see how, how closely related these languages are. So we have to care in A, so conveniently called to care in A and B, uh, or um, so this one is called in, in local, uh, into care in A, this is called uh, the language of Arshi, that's um, a Chinese Yanchi. Um, and uh, to care in B, locally called uh, Kushinya, which means the, lo the, the language of Kucha. And then we have Kotanese, uh, we have English, of course, and uh, here kind of the classical uh, in European languages, Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin. And let me just pick three uh, items here. Uh, let's do uh, the word for 100. So you see Kunt, Kante, Sata, Shatam, Hecaton, Kenton, uh, reconstruction, Kumtum. Very nice, very nicely related. Let's uh, take the name word, Nyom. Niem, Nama, name of course, Nama, Onoma, Nomen, then Nasman, the European reconstruction. And let's take one uh, verb, uh, per, per, bar, bear, English, uh, Sanskrit, Bharati, Greek, uh, Pharaoh, Latin, Pharaoh, and we reconstruct the root as fair, just to give an impression how related uh, the European languages are. Much easier, uh, or for the most part, much easier than in other language families. Um, why is Tokarian important? Uh, because we have these two uh, gentlemen, uh, Lukas Schema was a very uh, important translator of, of Buddhist uh, texts. Um, and we kind of still, um, this also includes like Nathan's uh, Han project. We, we're all kind of uh, trying to figure out what the language was they were translating from, um, likely, likely Sanskrit but also Middle Indic, and possibly there's some hints uh, uh, for that, that they were also translating stuff from Tokarian into uh, Chinese. Uh, so uh, look, Shema is, of course, very important, but even more important is Kumara Chiva, uh, because with Kumara Chiva, um, kind of the, uh, the tradition started, or the tradition stopped of kind of equating uh, Buddhism and, and Taoism, and, uh, and Kumara Chiva's translations are uh, uh, still read today. That's what my Chinese Buddhist friends tell me. Uh, um, and I don't think that's true for Lokakshima's translations. Um, so these guys were very likely um, uh, Tukarians, um, uh, but we know that they were kind of from this, this region, whether they really were native Tukarians and natively spoke Tukarian. Um, we, we don't quite know, but, but it's highly uh, likely. So uh, Tukarian in general is interesting because it's kind of a, a bridge uh, between Indo-European and, and Chinese. And of course, we'll talk more about this bridge function today. Um, here just uh, um, uh, kind of a thing uh, that we're um, discussing right now in European and will be continuing uh, to discuss. So usually if you saw um, an Indo-European uh, kind of stemma of how the la uh, languages are related, you always had a big bang. Uh, basically you had Indo-European and then all languages came out equally out of Proto-Indo-European. And that's of course not very likely. Uh, we, we know, I don't know, for the Romance languages and, and for most of the Semitic languages and for a lot of other uh, languages that uh, this can't be true um, because these kind of split-offs are defined by common uh, innovations and uh, so this is kind of a proposal of um, how uh, in European diversified. Um, I, I would say it's kind of a standard view. Uh, what, what I would kind of object to uh, and <laughs> we may, may talk about it is the Tocharian split of uh, second. I'm not sure. We know that Anatolian with the flagship uh, language Hittite split of first 
uh, because it's really very different from the others. Um, so Karen, I would argue, is actually quite close to, to Sanskrit and Greek, to kind of our classical um, uh, languages in, in terms of morphology and so on. Um, okay, why, why, I'm, I'm sure, uh, why uh, uh, am I showing you this uh, is because the, there is the assumption that Tocharian split of second and quite early in the third uh, uh, century BC, the uh, third millennium BC, and kind of ventured its way to the Altai Mountains and then down to, to China. And as we will see, there is no strong linguistic evidence for that. Um, this is mainly based on, on genetics. Why genetics? Because it's assumed that uh, um, these, these guys are uh, belong to the Yamnaya, um, special uh, mitochondrial DNA, and we find part of Yamnaya here and then in some of the mummies in the Tarim Basin, because as you know, probably the Tarim Basin is very famous for kind of attestation of mummies over almost three uh, millennia from, from the late third uh, millennium BC to, uh, to well, almost around common era, uh, basically, because they, they were only brought into the desert and then remained there because uh, the Takyamakan desert is one of the driest uh, deserts we have. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, this is then actually um, uh, from one of these uh, DNA uh, papers, uh, Li et al. Uh, analysis of ancient human mitochondrial DNA from the Xiaohe uh, Cemetery. So the Xiaohe Cemetery is here. This is uh, our friend in the Tarim Basin. Um, here we have this Afanasiabo uh, culture where we find traces. This is Andronobo culture, very likely, there may, or let's say there might be a relationship to uh, in the Iranian. Um, but anyway, uh, and, and these are kind of great roots uh, that, are, um, that are marked here. Um, uh, and you find basically Afanasiabo traces in, in a couple of, uh, so mitochondrial DNA traces in a couple of uh, uh, mummies, um, but but generally these mummies are super mixed. So there is there's DNA from literally all over the place uh, in in these mummies. But one trace is Afanasiwo, and then people said, okay, well, if we have these traces, then we can assume these were maybe Tukarians because later in the fourth century, our era, we find Tukarians there. They are Indo-European, so maybe there's a connection. Anyway, we don't know. Or, yeah, actually, we don't know if they were uh, to parents or not. Um, as you know, uh, we have a very good terminology uh, for uh, horse and carriage and everything that's connected to it in Indo-European. Um, so, so basically, these are the um, stylized uh, things that we have in the different languages. I mean, Celtic is relevant here. Uh, so... Uh, we have basically the, the, the cart, the wheel, uh, the, the fill, uh, the axle, and uh, the nave uh, attested. Um, and, and this is basically what this shows. It shows the, the, the parts and the words for it uh, that are cognates um, in the different uh, languages. And as you can see, uh, Anatolian doesn't have that much uh, of this uh, wheel. Uh, and and um, chariot um, kind of terminology, and to Karen only has the wheel, and we'll talk about that in in extensive. Um, okay. And here are all these all these words in the different languages because we are here in in Ireland. And let me pick out some of the Irish words. Uh, so we have uh, uh, roth here, uh, the the word for um, uh, um, wheel. Uh, and we have uh, uh, fen here, the word for, for wagon, uh, and so on. Uh, this is just to, to illustrate um, these different words in the different languages here. And of course, our, uh, our, the, the English term for wheel is related uh, to, to the Sanskrit term for wheel, chakra, chakra and wheel are directly related. This is actually a nice example for historical linguistics because they don't really look at all alike, but they are uh, direct cognates. Okay, so uh, now uh, uh, basically this is, this is a bit of my, my straw man here uh, with which I want to start. Um, uh, so uh, we have in, in uh, Elena Kuzmina's uh, work, The Origin of the Indo-Iranians, um, 
the, the quote, in, in the Eurasian steppes, metallurgy uh, will transport and horse breeding go back to the fourth millennium BC. So far, so good. That's very, very likely. Uh, and then we have, based on fully blamed, northern Chinese populations may have received metal, wheat, barley, wheat vehicles, the sheep and the horse from the Afanasiabo uh, tribes who came from the west. The words for all these were borrowed into Chinese from Indo-European, presumably to Karen. So that's a, that's a hypothesis. And so in, in this little first part, uh, we can test this hypothesis in looking at these um, different uh, things. Let's look at, um, at the metals. Uh, so we can basically reconstruct uh, is for Proto-European, uh, that's in, in Ayas, for example, in, in Sanskrit. Uh, and as you can see in old Chinese, um, Krim, um, modern Chinese, uh, Qin, um, there's no relation. And I'm using uh, a backstanser gas uh, reconstruction, which means uh, possible, uh, and this means, well, not, not, not so secure. So there's the brackets, right? Um, then copper also in, in, in words, the he is uh, in, in certain languages, the he is word also is used for copper. Uh, we have a word for copper in uh, Tocharian, Pilke, uh, but that's of course not related to he is. And of course the Chinese one is also not related in, at all to neither to Pilke nor to he is. Um, we have bronze, uh, probably also uh, he is, and again, no relation. Um, uh, then the word for silver, we have, we have in Tocharian, uh, Mikante, Mutatis Mutandis, going back somehow to Gergunto, uh, uh, but also Nren. This, this might, might, might work, but this is the best one of, of all these metals, but uh, 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 also uh, not too strong of a claim here. Then the word for gold, um, we have in Tokyo and Yasovus, but again, doesn't seem likely uh, that this uh, kind of was borrowed from Tokyo or any other European language. So from the metals, the most likely might be this one, if, if there was a borrowing. But uh, uh, there are not very good arguments uh, for that uh, yet, uh, because the phono phonology is uh, quite different. Then let's look at uh, wheat and barley. We have a word for wheat in European Gant. We actually have that in Tokyo and Kanti, uh, which means bread, but the Chinese word is quite different. Maruk uh, is, is, of course, something else. Then Bali, uh, Tokyo and Yap. Uh, again, the, I mean, these are related, uh, but, but of course, these are not related to, to, to Karen. And then uh, sheep, and we will talk about sheep uh, again today. Uh, we have uh, uh, hobby. We have it in, in Tocharian, um, and in old Chinese we have uh, Rang or something, uh, giving modern Chinese uh, Yang, but of course uh, the doesn't seem to be borrowed. So here with, with grasses and old vines, uh, there is uh, no borrowing uh, going on. And then let's look at uh, a horse and carriage. Um, so we have the word for chariot. Uh, some languages have at least chariot related things uh, uh, Proto-European hot, but that's not what uh, chariot is in, in Tocharian. In Tocharian we have kokale, uh, kukul, and that goes back to the, uh, basically to the chakra type uh, uh, word, uh, kweklo. Um, and uh, old Chinese, uh, sukra, and there's a second one, which looks quite similar. Uh, tukra, um, of course, cannot go back either to the Tocharian one, nor uh, to the Proto-European one. So, no no longer relation here. Then charioteer, um, we actually don't, we're not able to reconstruct the word for charioteer in, in Proto-European. Um, this one is just a derivative, of course, as, as you can see uh, from, from this one, uh, and the old Chinese uh, is very different. Is, there is no, uh, no point and therefore no uh, long word relation. Then we have the wheel word and uh, it's funny because uh, Queclo is the basis of, of Kokale. Uh, and basically, wheel um, turned as a, as a pass called Toto uh, into the word for, for uh, carriage or 
share it uh, in that case, which is also not not that weird. Uh, I think in English you can also say wheels to a car, at least in American English, I think. Um, and then uh, the, the word for wheel that we have in, in uh, to carry in B and A, Yerkanto uh, Wurkund, um, uh, goes not does not go back to uh, to Quaklo, and of course neither uh, Proto-European nor Tukarian is the basis of uh, Old Chinese uh, uh, Rum, which is which is funny that's actually <laughs> Rum anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, no no non word relation here. Then uh, the famous Excel word, and this is also of course uh, in in our word in the English word, uh, Germanic word for Excel, uh, Hex um, is not the basis of Shen. And neither Hex nor Shen are the basis for uh, the Rook. Then the Nave word, we have a Nave word in, in Tukarian. Also in, in the text, it actually appears uh, with, with the chariot word and with a couple of other words for, uh, for horses and carriages. Um, um, those does not go back to Hneb. That, that's actually what we also have in, in Nabel. Um, and both of them are not the basis of, of old Chinese uh, cock that we have here. Then uh, convey, wag, uh, might be in Tukarian, but if, if it is in Tukarian, it means something else. Uh, but both, uh, so Tukarian is not here, but Proto European form is, of course, not the, the basis of uh, old Chinese uh, tzus, so no loan word relation. And then the same is true for drive, we have it, that's Latin ago and so on uh, in, in Tukarian, but then in Chinese we have, uh, again, something completely different. Then a horse word uh, is there in uh, Tukarian, Yakwe Yuk, goes back to Hekwo, and that's Sanskrit Ashwa and Latin Equus, and, uh, yeah, and some things that are not around anymore in English. Um, uh, but if you like Lord of the Rings, it's in, in Eowyn, and the Eo is the, the horse part, and in, uh, in, in all these names that start with uh, Eo. Uh, Old Chinese, famously, we have Mara. Uh, that's one of the horse words, but again, Hekwo is not the basis of Mara. There is another uh, horse word in Indo European that usually gets connected with the Chinese one, and that's Mark, Marco, or something. But it's only in Germanic and Celtic, only, and it's far away from China <laughs> and, uh, and seem to be uh, alone into Germanic and Celtic from, from a different language. That's, that's what's in English, mer, um, uh, and, and so on. Um, and it seems to be paired actually with, with the word for breeches, braca, um, uh, horse, basically horse trousers. Um, about which we will also talk today, today uh, but a different one. Uh, and, and these seem to be basically loanwords into uh, Germanic and Celtic and seem not to be uh, related to this one. So, and here I have to make uh, an advertisement, uh, a horse excursion. Um, so uh, very likely the old Chinese term mana and maybe, uh, uh, maybe even going further back, um, uh, is, is very likely or possibly from Old Indic uh, Arvand. Uh, the phonology is a bit intricate, but not impossible. Uh, and Nathan and I and a couple of other colleagues have a paper on that uh, coming up shortly, so uh, stay, stay tuned. Um, and there is one possible loanword. We already saw it uh, today. And I will also refer you to our forthcoming paper, but this was suggested already by Puni Blank, I think, the first time. But basically, that the, the reconstruction kra, so consonant kra, and then the kra um, in in Chinese that give ju and ch and ch in in modern Chinese. Uh, basically, they look like like they're a long word. I mean, why would you have two uh, words that uh, look very similar? So it seem to be two kind of long words, and very likely also from uh, from old Indic. And we can maybe then talk about why. Uh, by old Indic, but it makes phonological sense and then it, it makes sense on, on kind of a horse and chariot uh, perspective as well. Um, so this were, was our horse and chariot excursion and uh, please read our paper, hopefully it will appear this, this end of this year. Okay, so, uh, but now let's talk about uh, real loans. Uh, so so we, we're basically going back uh, 
from, from uh, this little straw man I put up. So uh, based on Poodle Blank, a lot of people have claimed and still claim that their uh, that mythology, certain grains, uh, certain animals, um, and uh, and certain metals basically came uh, from from European uh, uh, languages to uh, to China. So Tocharin is is not a source, um, and uh, the the uh, Proto-European is not a source. Um, a possible source for horse and chariot uh, might be uh, uh, Indic. But now let's let's focus on Tocharin again and move uh, move basically a little bit closer to the Tocharian uh, at the station time before we move back um, and, and uh, try to talk about uh, more ancient uh, uh, contexts almost uh, in, in the realm of, of, or basically in the realm of, of old Chinese again. But some um, uh, loanwords we, we have and they're uh, easy and nice and they're related to, to uh, kind of trade. Um, not, not all of them, but a, but a lot of them. So, uh, for example, Tugarin uh, Shank is from Middle Chinese or seemed to be from Middle Chinese uh, Xing. Uh, Tao from uh, Dou. Uh, Chuck from Tiek. Another Chuck, but a different Chuck uh, from Tiek. Uh, Chane from Tien. Uh, Kao from Kao. Um, Bolt of Silk, which was basically used as money. Um, uh, Sveljank, uh, Sveljank uh, grain tax uh, from uh, uh, Sveljank um, uh, grain tax. Uh, so, so these are all nice and kind of related to trade uh, uh, activities. And we find them in uh, Tocharian secular texts to deal with uh, basically uh, trade and, and kind of caravan uh, passages and stuff like that. Then uh, we have some officials that uh, names for officials that appear in these uh, secular documents, uh, like uh, Tiankun, um, general from Tiankun, easy. Uh, Sima, um, yeah, well, you all know uh, at least one Sima. <laughs> uh, uh, Hushi, envoy, um, and, and these are kind of three nice, uh, nice uh, titles that have been known from, from Middle Chinese. Um, then uh, there, are, there are some where it's not that easy to establish the context, but maybe also trade related could be the word for blue, uh, Zen from uh, Qing, and then uh, maybe also trade related the word for sauce, uh, Tiang uh, from uh, Tiang. Um, uh, so these are these are quite quite nice, I believe. Um, and then are some there are some later loans. Uh, in later uh, secular texts, so Shao receipt um, from Chao copy, uh, Zun uh, inch again another measure uh, from Zun uh, inch um, and so on. So these are these are uh, fairly established, and then um, to escort uh, uh, or an, an escort for for goods again kind of the trade um, relationship we expect, uh, and we have um, Yai Yen from Yai Yun, um, so not not that bad, but. Later, later things. Okay, so these are later things. These are quite nicely established. So it's really hot here. I'm sorry, that's. It's um, um, there is a window. Yeah, there is a window. We can... Oh really? Yeah. Ah yeah. Oh, yeah. Shouldn't be too loud. Yes. Yeah. I'm I'm almost distracted from my own. <laughs> uh, sorry. And now everything is on record. Uh, anyway, so uh, th these are quite quite established ones. Uh, but let's move. So we, we move forward, but let's now move back again and uh, say something about uh, to care in archaeology. Uh, so actually, there is no uh, to care in archaeological horizon anywhere between the Proto-European homeland uh, in in uh, in the Pontic. Uh, and the Tarim Basin that can be connected with uh, the Tocharians with certainty. Uh, none of the archaeological sites within modern uh, Xinjiang have any distinctive Tocharian flavor. And the material culture in the Tarim Basin at the beginning of our textual attestation around the fourth uh, century is, is predominantly Iranian. Um, very likely because uh, the Kushans took over kind of material culture from uh, neighboring Iranian uh, uh, culture 
and uh, for some time were active uh, in, in the Turing Basin. But otherwise, we have, of course, a classical multicultural uh, display of things that we expect in this uh, Silk Road area. Um, yeah, different European potential groups uh, and their migrations are mentioned uh, in, in this general area. Uh, so somewhere between today's uh, Gansu uh, province and the Amudarya uh, region in, to the west. And we, we have this in, in ancient Greek and Chinese uh, uh, sources. And we'll come back uh, to this uh, later. Um, none of these uh, groups that are mentioned and that could potentially be in European uh, uh, can be safely identified uh, with Tukarians yet. And at, to, to just uh, uh, take the excitement away already, so I will also not contribute anything uh, reasonable to this question, um, but uh, I will hopefully convince you of some, um, some connections, some early connections uh, uh, for, for Tukarians in China. Okay, let's uh, start with sheep here, because I, I want to show you some interesting long words that must have appeared in a very old period of, of, uh, of contact between uh, basically old Chinese and, and proto tukarian um, uh, speakers. So uh, sheep were domesticated about 8,000 BC in the Near East and woolly sheep occurred around 4,000 BCE. And the oldest wool that is extant and that we have uh, is from Egypt and dates uh, to the fourth millennium BCE. Um, so this is, I'm not a biologist, but who, who's interested, this is kind of the development of uh, sheep. And uh, this is kind of, uh, how this happened geographically, and then from there, uh, sheep spread uh, uh, to everywhere, basically. Okay, what's interesting is um, that we have a lot of wool actually from the Tarim Basin, uh, because uh, uh, as I said before, Taklamakan, one of the driest deserts, there's a lot of uh, uh, actual real nice uh, cloth uh, preserved, and then there is a lot of wool. So this is a, a wool blanket uh, and this was wrapped around one of these mummies that we have. And it's from the, from the Xiaohe uh, cemetery that we already mentioned today. And it's from, from kind of middle uh, uh, second uh, millennium BC. Um, this is also very nice. Uh, this is also a wrap uh, of a mummy. And that's from the Chebrikul um, uh, cemetery, also uh, second millennium BC. And uh, this is uh, an infant uh, mummy wearing a blue and red uh, felt hat, uh, but it's shrouded in, in a woolen uh, cloth um, with, with that kind of this bi-colored uh, uh, cord here. And famously, uh, we have this very first oldest pants ever uh, from the Tarim Basin. Um, so uh, this is the oldest uh, trousers, and we kind of know trousers were uh, developed um, for horse riding for, for obvious reasons that I don't have to go into uh, in, in detail. Um, and it's from uh, a Yangkai uh, graveyard, and it's from around uh, 1000 uh, uh, BC. Uh, so, so end of second, beginning of first uh, millennium. Okay. So let's look at sheep and, and wool in, in Indo-European again. So we have uh, Hovi and Hevi. Uh, so basically they belong to, to the same paradigm. Uh, dominative and accusative are built on the old stem and the rest is built on uh, the east stem. And both is attested. Uh, so we have uh, Ois uh, in Greek and Ovis in, in Latin and they go back to the old stem. And we have uh, uh, Au, uh, actually meaning uh, you, in, in to carry B and that goes back to the, to the E grade. So that's perfectly nice. Uh, and there's more uh, uh, petit, petit, uh, um, but we don't have to, to go into that. Then we have a, a fairly nicely established word for, for wool, Hulchnech, uh, uh, and uh, that's in, in Hittite, Hulana, uh, in Sanskrit, Urna, uh, in Greek, Lenos, uh, Latin, Lana, and so on. And also our word for wool. Uh, goes also back uh, to this, but so far there's no cognate for this wool word 
in, into Karen. There is a uh, yoke in both languages, but that's, that seems to be, uh, well, basically there's no etymological connection. It seems to be uh, not in European. So maybe this is, there were probably languages that we don't have recorded there in the Tarim Basin, and this might be uh, a word for Wu that goes back to uh, one of the languages that one of the mummies or several of the mummies spoke before the Tuckerians came in, but, but there was already wool around, uh, very likely. Okay, uh, so let's just look at, at uh, some uh, attestations here. Uh, so this is from, from a secular text, uh, and, and it basically says, so the Buddha's cloth uh, made of white silk, maybe uh, for, for culture, uh, with a fringe of wool, one. So basically it's, a, it's kind of a, um, a list of, of saying, okay, uh, this and this garment, and this and this cloth, and here we have the yoke uh, uh, word. Uh, basically, I just want to show you the, um, the attestation. Uh, and here, uh, from the Pratimoksha Sutra, so a non-secular text, uh, uh, a commentary on, on basically uh, the Naisargika, so, and these are transgressions punished with the confiscation of, of, of uh, goods, basically. And we have, uh, if a monk gives uh, to an unrelated nun some wool to work, this wool must be uh, abandoned by him. And the nun probably can, can keep it. But they should not, I mean, you know, these Buddhist rules, they're kind of weird, and we <laughs> don't always get uh, what's going on. But uh, uh, basically, we have, we have this yok. Uh, Yakva is, is kind of the collective. Um, of your uh, here in, in these instances. This is just to show you where this stuff uh, appears. And here's a magical text where it uh, appears. Um, uh, so if one has the desire to uh, be long-lived, one has to weave trousers out of black wool. <laughs> For what reason ever? <laughs> well, but maybe the same reason why you have to wear pants when you ride a horse. Um, anyway. Um, uh, here's another uh, secular text that also uh, brings uh, the sheep in, but I want to get uh, to something else. Uh, Name there's another word for wool, and that's kind of interesting. Um, and it appears in a very uh, famous uh, story um, where, so basically it's, it's a Buddhist story uh, about the painter and the mechanic, and uh, it, it appears in the Punyavanta Jataka, and um, they, they kind of have a fight, and, uh, um, and kind of everybody tries to show their skill. And, and of course, there's a, a Buddhist uh, uh, reasoning at the very end. But then there's the story about uh, a mechanical girl, basically a robot that the mechanic produced to fool the painter. And the painter is actually fooled. And then uh, when he realizes that he's fooled, he paints a painting uh, where he is shown uh, uh, being hanged. Uh, and then the mechanic comes in and looks at the painting and says, oh my God, he hanged himself because it played this practical joke on him. But the practical joke was this uh, mechanical uh, girl that, that the uh, mechanic did. And let me just quote it here. So when the painter then, full of love, reached for the hand of the artificial girl, uh, this one immediately broke asunder and her rags, um, that's Kratzwanje, uh, ropes and pins fell apart and there was no longer a girl. Oh, what awesome power of ignorance when a human pe being is so intensely, so intensely falls in love uh, with mere rags, uh, Kratzwas. Uh, just like uh, of the ones composed of rags, uh, Kratzwan, uh, pins and ropes, my imagination was this, just uh, so of the ones composed of bones, flesh, and sinews is the self-imagination -im of the beings, as my love was towards rags, just so it is to the living body in turn. So there's already the kind of the the Buddhist uh, morale here, uh, like, like the, the painter fell in love with rags, we kind of fall in love or, or are infatuated by our own kind of material um, uh, being. But what we want to get at here is, is uh, rags. And I hope you will get the pun in, in, in a minute. Um, okay, now we have another text, and it's from Tukerim B. Uh, that's again uh, uh, kind of a 
um, uh, a rule-based uh, thing. So that's a commentary on the Sangha Bhavish, Sangha Bhavishi Sha. Um, and these are sins uh, punished with uh, temporary excommunication out of the Sangha of the Buddhist uh, community. Um, and here is the Sanskrit uh, version, and we turn to the commentary of the Sanskrit passage into Karen in a second. So, uh, intentional emission of semen, though it is a different matter if it is during sleep, is an uh, offense punishable by expulsion of the Sangha. That's the Sanskrit part. And then here we have the Tukarian B part, uh, which basically is a commentary on this passage. If there are uh, feelings of lust in the mind of the monk uh, and his penis stands high, he touches it with the rag and he enjoys that, and uh, his sperm comes out, then he commits the Sangha Bavesha offense. If his sperm uh, does not come out as often as he touches it with the rag, so often he commits a grave uh, offense that has to be confessed to the whole community. And we have a Kretzvisa, a Kretzvisa, and again, usually this is translated as as, uh, as rag, right? And, and I mean, it's kind of a, uh, and again, please don't take offense, but kind of a, of a, of a handkerchief, right? <laughs> um, uh, in, this, in this case. Um, and what, what is Kretzwe Kratzu? Uh, it goes back to, to Karen uh, Kretzwe, uh, probably to Karen Kretzwe. And there are two possible scenarios to explain that uh, word uh, from Indo European. So either we have a, a root noun, so this, this basically are just nouns in Indo European that, that only have, have roots, right? No, no suffix attached. Um, and it goes back to, to grot gret, uh, scratching. Um, and then it would be related to German uh, uh, kratzen and scratch. And it would basically be kind of a scratchy cloth, uh, something with which you can scratch your itch. Um, and then uh, to, to get it to carry in form, it could have just be an, uh, an analogy. So basically to saiwe, where, where we have a perfect Latin cognate, uh, saibus, uh, which means itching actually. Uh, and then uh, analogically, it, we would get kretzwe uh, because you reinterpreted the we as kind of a suffix of, of coarseness or itchiness, but it would basically uh, be similar like, uh, like this analogy that you have in, in height uh, to, to depth and length, uh, right? So basically just with other words that have the same ending and you put it on there because they kind of belong to the same semantic category. Another possibility to do this, to do this from in European would be to assume kind of a complicated derivational Thing. You have an S term, and to this S term you make a U uh, adjective, and to the U adjective you make a U abstract, and then again make an adjective possible, but then it could be uh, related to uh, proto European cred to spin, and then uh, we could relate it to Hitler Kartzan, uh, which means uh, Swift. So, uh, yeah, you all know what a Swift is, right? It's kind of a thing to uh, basically spin wool on. Yeah, whatever, whatever we prefer, we now want to turn to Chinese uh, again. Um, what's interesting is modern Chinese uh, qi, uh, uh, sorry, wrong tone, qi, uh, woolen cloth, uh, fishnet, uh, rug, um, goes back to Middle Chinese uh, qie, and that goes back in the back of Sagar uh, reconstruction uh, to Kratz. Uh, so it's kind of cool. And uh, in the Erya, um, which is a warring state period uh, dictionary, um, we have uh, the gloss. It's a textile made of coarse wool. It's quite nice. We can do one better. In the uh, Shouwen Chitsu, we have, uh, which is a Han uh, period um, dictionary, uh, we have the following commentary uh, on uh, this character, namely woolen cloth from Western foreigners. Well, it actually says barbarians, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, which, yeah, it's true. Uh, but uh, that, that's, of course, very, very nice philological evidence to, to back this up. Um, so basically, our, our preliminary conclusion is that Kretzwe uh, Kratzu, based on, on kind of our philological uh, evidence, must be coarse boom cloth of some sort and likely goes back to, to Kretz and I would, I would stick to my uh, scratch etymology 
with uh, the root noun, and uh, proletarian kreds, kreds was borrowed into old Chinese. Um, and that means uh, before the kind of virtual invented date of uh, 221 BCE, but around, so basically uh, in, in, let's say, second, uh, second half of the first millennium BCE. Um, and that would fit nicely with other words that have been borrowed. Uh, so uh, we have uh, meat, of course, um, uh, which is the, the word for honey, me. And I would stick to this uh, uh, against my colleague and friend, uh, Guillaume Schack, um, and another colleague and friend, uh, uh, Michel Perrault, uh, and Christine Meyer um, argued very nicely against what, what uh, Guillaume uh, said, and I would stick to, to uh, this etymology that it is actually borrowed from Tokeri. Um, and it also makes sense archaeologically, because uh, similar to, to uh, let's say, horse and chariot that we were talking about before, honey kind of uh, appears magically in the archaeological, well, magically, it appears overnight more or less in the archaeological uh, record, like uh, chariot and horse in the, in the Shang period, uh, so quite sudden. Uh, which suggests that it was brought by, by context. And the time would fit basically uh, what we believe about uh, Frodo to Karen being spoken in the second uh, half uh, of the first millennium BC. Um, another uh, another Frodo to Karen uh, loanword is, uh, is a plant called uh, Devil's Dung, so Asa Foetida. Um, this itself is a borrowing uh, into Tocharian from, from Indo Iranians. Uh, and it is a spice that basically comes from, from Iranian um, uh, areas, uh, so basically Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, and, then, and then spread. Uh, but this was uh, borrowed into uh, this Chinese, old Chinese uh, monster word, but, but everything works out basically. So the, the, this all, all phonology is, is basically correct and, and gives perfect sense uh, if it's also pro Sukarian longer. Uh, and there's, there's another one, uh, sorry, and now we, we look at the other direction. This has been uh, claimed uh, for a long time, but I think it's basically right. So uh, old uh, Chinese uh, Lu, the word for rice was borrowed into, or rice paddy, uh, was borrowed into, uh, into proto to carry. And then uh, this is another one that I uh, discovered. So we have this reconstruction consonant mans. In, uh, in Baxter and Sagar system uh, for one, um, so myriad, uh, 10,000. And this must be the origin of um, Prototokaria and Tmane, and then uh, E, Tmane, and A, Tman, uh, myriad, uh, 10,000. Um, it cannot be from Prototurkic Tumen, uh, because then you would expect palatalization in Tokarian, uh, and very likely Prototurkic Tumen also goes back to uh, Tman. This connection was not believed because we were, we were all not sure about the, the consonant here, but I think now we can be, uh, it must be a T uh, because of this Tukarian evidence. Uh, and maybe another one, uh, not, not so clear whether we should actually reconstruct the consonant here. Um, so the, um, the, the uh, kind of other Chinese uh, uh, system of uh, old Chinese reconstruction does not reconstruct uh, the consonant, and this would fit with uh, what we have in, in Tukarian here, um, so the, the last month uh, of the year. Um, so that's uh, quite nice, I think. Um, and then here's one where we should investigate more, uh, because the direction is not, not quite clear. Uh, so we saw some uh, Old Chinese into Tukarian, some uh, Tukarian into Old Chinese. And here I have to say I'm, I'm not quite sure, because there are two types of, of, of goose, and one basically migrated from, or basically came from uh, east to west, and there's another one who uh, came with uh, cultural transmission from west to east. So I don't know what to do. But we have, we have basically Kente, uh, a goose in Tokarian, uh, um, going back to, to something uh, Gohons, um, and we have uh, Gong in, in Old Chinese, so something is going on. But I am now, right now, I'm not certain 
in which direction uh, this this uh, relation uh, went. Okay, so we're we're kind of nearing the end. Um, so some some conclusion. So the oldest uh, uh, linguistic context between speakers of Old Chinese and Proto-Turkarian must have appeared before the beginning um, of the Middle Chinese period, roughly around uh, the unification of China. Um, presumably in an area where agriculture of Chinese-speaking uh, population and pastoralism of Proto-Turkarian-speaking uh, uh, population kind of converged, and pastoralism in, in in the broadest sense, uh, if, if you can call beekeeping pastoralism, then that's what I mean. <laughs> um, so basically rice and, and, uh, and honey as, as kind of the, the, the two uh, uh, things here uh, to have in mind. Um, and also, this must have been in an in a, a area of China where rice growing was possible, uh, maybe Gansu. Um, uh, before rice cultivation came to Xinjiang, and rice cultivation came to Xinjiang uh, around 2,000 years ago. So this must have been before that. Um, and Gansu might be a, a likely candidate, and that would fit with some uh, um, kind of historical sources that we have in Chinese, namely that the population that was later identified with Tocharians, the, the Yu Chu or Ro Chu. Uh, was kicked out by the Hyungmu, drove over the Tarim Basin into uh, historical Tukharistan, which is Bactria, and one part gave rise to the Kushan Empire and another part of this population moved back to the Tarim Basin. With this story, this kind of conjecture, this might, uh, might be our uh, proto-Tukharians. Yeah, uh, and these contacts, so the ones between Old Chinese and proto-Tukharian, uh, amount basically to the first evidence of Tocharians uh, close to or in ancient China. Everything else, I would not uh, um, basically bet too much on this genetic evidence because we know the genes and languages are super separate, uh, and and uh, um, every every linguistic or cultural um, argument solely based on genetics is just speculation at best. It can be a lot of other ugly things as well. Um, yeah, like, like in later times, these contacts happened uh, by the way of exchange or trade on the Silk Road, before the Silk Road, um, and I would call this the Wu Road. The other thing that's kind of linguistically important is um, that Lomerts are able to inform the reconstruction of, of Old Chinese. So not expecting another hundred, or we, because I'm, uh, I have to mention Bill Baxter here, uh, even though we have not uh, I worked on this for a long time for, for different reasons, but we will resume this work. I'm not expecting another hundred Lombards or so uh, in, in Old Chinese, or we don't expect it. Um, uh, but there might be uh, a couple of more. But the thing is that uh, uh, Lombards can inform the reconstruction of both languages, the phonological reconstruction, and in the case of Graz, I think it makes all these brackets unnecessary. And in the case of Tmans, we now know that this consonant must have, uh, this consonant must have been uh, a T. And with this, in, as my postdoc uh, never stops to remind me, non-idiomatic uh, uh, to carry B, I say, yes, Pausko Kritanen, yes, so thank you for your attention. Is it a tonal language? To carry? Uh. No. But Old Chinese was also not tonal. So yeah, very good. but uh, can I ask when did Chinese language develop the tone? But because in, in oh, yeah. I mean, he knows more about it than I. Early in the Han Dynasty. Ah, okay. Another archaeological one or cultural one. They they, they have the the mummy thing mm -hmm. in that area as well. In so Xinjiang actually uh, has more mummies than Egypt. Okay. <laughs> that's that's a not, not a well-known fact, but it's, that's yeah. the truth. So let's believe this forthcoming paper about the uh, etymology <laughs> of Arvand, Yep. which means that the, the horse and the chariot come from the Proto-Indo-Aryans, yeah? Yep. So, but then you said that honey entered the archaeological record also in Shang? No, no, no sorry. Okay. I was just saying that it like... 
uh, oh, like a forest okay. creature, it, it kind of appears Here suddenly. Okay. suddenly. Okay. So honey is later than... It's, it's later. Okay. So, so the, the, um, the internal Chinese evidence for honey, uh, I think the first text is from the, the 4th century uh, BC. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay, that's, so that's easy. Then about goose, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this is, or uh, maybe this is a way to ask you, what's the standard... Indo-Europeanists say about, you know, Hansa, Gans, kind of English goose, yeah? Because I, I think they probably don't say it's a borrowing from Chinese. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. But um, so what's, what sticks out if you compare all the goose words is to carry in with, with O grade. Oh, I see. Okay, so everyone has A grade. Everyone has uh, A grade, but uh, the thing is... The, uh, so the, the goose word in, in Germanic, Baltic, and Slavic, um, there it's reconstructed. I mean, maybe they're even close related, but I mean, Baltic and Slavic are close related. And then you have Germanic, but all of these go back to, uh, to, a, to an A, basically. But this A in Baltic, Slavic, and Germanic could go back to O. Um, oh, yes, you can't tell in, 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 in Baltic, Slavic, and Germanic. Yeah, it exactly. could be A or O. But like in, uh, I mean, you can't tell in Sanskrit either. But uh, no, exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> it, it, but somewhere you can tell it's an A grade. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we don't know much about roots that had inherent R. What how they basically uploaded. So I, I can see a world where you have O R or R O upload or this kind of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then fine, yeah, and then then that's fine. So I think. But if I were linguistically, from... um, we cannot do much except stating the facts. This the, the goose question has to be decided uh, by basically by archaeologists and biologists. Uh, in yeah. Way. I but guess you can make a. If I can just pursue that a little bit more, though, like um, the, a, the we don't like roots with 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 vowel ah, right? But the Leiden, Leiden people don't like yeah, it. Yeah, okay, that's I, what I'm saying. I perfectly right. like You're it. perfectly okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, there, so, 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 like, uh, astu in, in Greek, astu, uh, uh, so, uh, ost in, in Tukarian, um, uh, bastu in, in Sanskrit, must have an art. Oh, yeah. Okay. But, but it's, that's just one very but, but could that point to alone origin? Could that be taken as evidence of the alone origin? The, uh, I mean, it wouldn't work for Chinese because that. No, exactly. So, okay. um, so as as I said, if for the for the goose word, I think we just need a little bit more evidence. Which what, what kind of goose travels in which direction? Yeah. Would, okay. And <laughs> although it could be on a way. Yeah, that's actually true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's that's actually something I should have, I should say more prominent. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Yes. Yeah. So I I increasingly think that's the explanation for dog. It's, it's, oh really? It's just. Okay. Dogs go. Grr. <laughs> 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 yeah, right. I mean, there, there you also you have connections that are that are weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Yeah, yeah okay. Uh, so my last question about rice. So, like, I was so rice. I don't know. If, if a student just came up to me and said, "Tell me about rice," I would say it was domesticated in southern China, and that that. The Chinese really like millet uh, for a long time. So what? So can you just tell me a story about the the kind of the 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 archaeology and the historical linguistics for rice? I mean, um, I'm not a rice expert, but uh, but we know that um, so rice came to Xinjiang as I said before uh, two thousand years ago, and before that we, we already had it in Gansu. Um, and of course, it spread from from the south, and it never I mean up up to this day never quite reached the, the, the real north. Um, uh, but, but it did, but but it's not that popular, right? Yeah, they like noodles. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, uh, but I mean, if we have it in Gansu in the first millennium, which we do. Then it's perfectly fine. Yeah, so uh, basically, it, it, it does, it's not necessary that it's like a major staple of the northern diet. It's just necessary that it's available on the market exactly. in in Xinjiang. Yeah. I mean, the, the question is how it then came to uh, came to Xinjiang, for example. And it would be nice, but of course, I mean, that's pure speculation. But it would be nice to say, well, maybe the Tukarians when they entered the Tarim Basin brought rice with them. 
in the OACs, right? Oh, but, from China. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, okay. um, but that's, that's complete speculation, but one could make up the story and, and see whether it holds true. <laughs>